one more time, entrepreneurs, I'm honored to be in front of you all. Being a fellow entrepreneur, I know it's not easy. And, uh, and Joy is right, when I did start the business in July of 2002, it uh, was arguably the worst time to start a business. In fact, I was interviewed by Denver Business Journal, and they said, you've got to be kidding me. This is the worst time to start a business. Why would you do it now? And my answer was, you know what? If people buy it now, when good times start, it's going to be that much better. And I would say, well, July 15th was our seven-year anniversary. So we look, we've got about 20 people on the payroll on a monthly basis. We've got about uh, 85 some odd customers, recognized names like you would know, SAP, Sun Microsystems, Sybase, Level 3, to small to mid-sized companies. And I'll share with you what the business problem we solved and the, the pain that I had throughout it, but I just wanted to take a minute because I don't actually have the opportunity to sit in front of so many other fellow entrepreneurs and I want you to know that uh, I do respect each and every one of you that have done it because I know it's not easy. Um, and Joy, and uh, uh, Joy did say that uh, we, are seven, we are seven years old, we haven't taken money. When I first started, that wasn't the plan. <laughs> I wanted to take money. <laughs> But uh, as we know, in July of 2002, was not a very friendly time in the VC world to go raise money, nor the angel group. So, uh, you know, we grew the business the old-fashioned way and uh, grew it on customer revenues. And to this day, we continue to do so. And that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's part of the story I'd like to share with you today. So who am I? 20 years in sales, B2B sales, software sales, hardware sales, um, channel sales, worked for companies, computer printing companies like uh, Okie Data that competed with uh, Hewlett Packard to uh, um, large software companies uh, to small VC funded companies that you wouldn't even know the names to. Um, but inevitably, they all shared the same problem, and that was the, the uh, offshoot of what I was looking to solve. And uh, in B2B and high-tech sales, and everyone here, I was just chatting with a, a gentleman earlier where he said, references online, what is references online? And I said, uh, and I'll ask this question to everybody here, has anybody been trying to pitch their wares or pitch their products and you get an interested person, an interested prospect? And they say, hey, Jim, wow, that sounds great. Do you have any other customers? This is the gentleman we were just talking about. And the first thing you say is, yes, of course. I've got Joy. I've got Elizabeth. I've got Joe, right? <laughs> right. So meanwhile, you're thinking through this, right? Because you know where this conversation's going. It's like, hey, you know what? I'd really feel more comfortable if I could actually talk to some of your customers, right? They wanted to do a reference check. They wanted to talk to your references. And how much of a pain in the butt is that actual request. Think about it, I mean, every, how many people here have actually tried to fulfill that request, right? And what's the, and what's the drill like? Hey, hey, uh, Julian, would you do me a favor and take a call from Elizabeth? She really likes her stuff, she just wants to talk to one of my customers. And Julian says, of course, Jim, I'd be more than happy to do it. You're a great cut vendor of mine, and blah, 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 blah. And you're like, great. And then you try to get on, your, on that prospect's calendar, and then the, your vendor, your customer's calendar, and back and forth. And uh, P.S., you're never invited to that conversation, and you're just hoping that it goes well, because your deal, you know, relies on that, that a very positive experience. So let's say that the experience is positive. You know, God forbid they have a bad day, or they're, you know, running to catch a plane, or something to that effect. Um, but then it goes great. And now you're in another sales cycle, a week later. And what happens? Same thing. And you're like, of course I've got customers. And you're like, great, I'd like to talk with them. Julian, would you do me a favor, take a call from, she really likes her stuff. After a while, Julian gets the whole, you know, he becomes less available. The calls aren't as enthusiastic as they once were. And especially in startup mode, you know, you have some issues throughout the, uh, through your products and so on. So the good days can, you know, your references can go in and out of referenceability, so to speak. So that was the problem that I had. Um, that I said, you know what, I'm a VP of sales, we're growing the business, not only, it's like a hot potato, who's going to call Julian today, right? And I was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. 
And uh, so I was in a meeting with uh, our VP, uh, the management team, and they, the CEO who had a sales background, he says, Jim, what are your obstacles to sale? What's, sale, you know, what's preventing closing deals faster, sooner, better? And I was like, I, I just, we don't have enough uh, people to talk to. I just can't ask to, to Julian, would you do me a favor? Take another call. So I raised my hand. I was like, listen, why don't we do this? I mean, who are we kidding ourselves? The prospect needs to talk to the reference customer. It's obvious. And I said, why don't we go down and interview them? I said, you know what, better yet, I don't want our marketing department to go down and interview the customer, right? Because they're going to come back to me and say, Jim, who did the interview? And I'm like, oh, I'm a marketing department, right? Where was the credibility there? Because P.S., we weren't invited to those calls between the prospect and the reference anyway. So I said, um, you know what, let's hire somebody else to do it. Let's do a third party, let them do it, and this way I can say, hey, so-and-so. And I was like, and they were like, yeah. And then the marketing guy goes, great, I'll put that on my list of things to do, right? So it went right, way down. But I, I knew I had something there because I, as a VP of sales and a sales guy, couldn't close my own deals without talking to a reference. And that was it. So the concept was interview the customers, interview your references, and put them online. Hence the name References Online. So I had, honestly, as all fellow startup entrepreneurs here, honestly, I had one good idea. And now I'm the CEO of this company that is 20 some odd people, 85 some odd customers growing and people go, oh, what about this? What about this? I'm like, I don't know. You know, I, I never, <laughs> I said I never claimed to be the expert. I just knew I had one idea and that I personally would pay to have this done. So um, I'm proud to say seven years later, we have over a dozen products and services that we bring to the market now, all kind of touching that whole reference space. Um, I didn't come up with any of the other ideas. I had a vision of where I thought that it should go and a natural thing, but the customers just kept coming back and said, you know what, it would be great if this, what about this, have you thought about this? And if you did this, I'd pay for it. And that was kind of the evolution and the culture that we have at References Online, where everybody has some interaction with the clients and they get their feedback. So um, we're actually going to roll out this new product and the marketing team was like, well, we need to do this beta program. We need to do this beta. We've got to seed the customers with this new product. And I was like, I was like honestly, I'll, they're paying for the new product because they were an integral part in developing the product. So I can tell you now, seven years later, I have not taken a dime. Not that I didn't want to, but I didn't take a dime. And um, we have over a dozen solutions that our customers continue to, to uh, to uh, embrace and use. So that's a little bit about how I started the business, and I'd like to t take you a little bit further on the journey, if that's okay. Um, 2002, we launched. I created it. Honestly, I had one good idea. And you know how I did it? Probably like you guys do. Hey, if I built this and I did this, would you guys, what do you think of it? And I did my network, right? I mean, I'm in Denver now 10 years, seven of those years is the business. And before I did it, I was selling high tech into telco. So I kind of knew the space and I would go to my partners and other folks that I knew in my network and I said, hey, this is what I'm doing. They're like, Jim, we have that same problem. And I'm like, really, what would you pay for it? And that, you know, that's kind of how you start. You're like, there you go. So um, when I first launched the company, I had customers. I had paying customers for the product and the, and the service. So not to mention, I always, to this day, would say, Jim, would you still take money out of your pocket to pay for the service? And that's kind of how I, I, I kind of, judge it, you know, the, the old litmus test. And, and I still think that the solution is compelling. As you know, I'm tw I just shared over 20 some odd years selling. There's nothing else there out there that I'd still want to sell than what we have right now. So, well, um, but you know what? It, who's kidding who, right? It's tough out there. You know, July 2002, it was tough. Well, 2009, with a payroll of 20 some odd people and fee mouths to feed and people saying, hey, we're about payroll and expenses and development and all these things I never had planned, they, it's tough out there. And you guys probably feel that as well. And you're constantly asking yourself the question, what do I got to do different? How do I change things? What do I do? And I will tell you that because of the model that we have at References Online, where the customers are such an integral part when budgets came down, we were one of the few products that continued to make it through that gauntlet of program cut, program cut. And we asked them and they were like, well, it's, it's the no-brainer. We helped design the, the system that we're using. So how could we go and say, yeah, we don't need that anymore when they architected it, right? They were a key component. Oh, and by the way, we are a SaaS model, right? So um, 
software as a service, so the salesforce.com type of uh, implementation. So uh, it's a pretty nice way to get into, the, into it and leverage a lot of your customer feedback and build it into the system. So we have a lot of uh, very uh, real-time, quick-time turnaround uh, because of that model. Um, and again, over t uh, more than a dozen products and services. And how did you do it? You keep every, your, your goal, obviously, is to keep everybody happy. Uh, customer support and retention, valuing the, uh, each customer's feedback and inspiring loyalty and innovation. And the um, watermark on that is customers continuing to renew their contracts in this tough economy. So that, was, uh, you know, that says that I think we're doing something right there. And, and jo I asked Joy, as I'm going through these slides, I think there were some ideas that she wanted me to cover, so <laughs> please holler out if, uh, if I'm missing something. Um, but actually implementing it. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, I don't know if this is the, the slide. Um, the one thing that I did is um, we gave Dan Montoya, our VP of Operations, a lot of authority, if you will, in, in the communication cycle. So he's the VP of Operations, but is, he includes VP of Client Implementations. So he's there and really on the front lines of getting the customers going, and especially selling or implementing what the sales guy sells, right? Which is, can, can be contentious, I think is the word sometimes. Right? So he's there, and he's able to you know, under, listen and hear and, and share. Um, and then two, the project management team reports into him, which is part of the implementation team. He, oh, oh, product development rolls under him. So he works with the developers on that. And so he is a very gifted individual in getting, because you can imagine, once you open the door and say, hey, customers, tell us everything you want in the product, I mean, that list can get long, right? So he does a very good job in, in trying to man manage that, and I'll share a little bit uh, about that uh, later. Um, and then account managers. So it's one thing, you know, to sell it. There's another thing to implement it. And then there's another thing to just walk away and say, hey, have a good day. But he's responsible for the continued customer loyalty and satisfaction of the product. So that's something that, I, that, we've, that, that we've done at References Online. And that seems to work well. And I, and I, and I guess it's, well, I don't guess. I know it's, it's, it's attributed to his uh, skill set um, and communication style. Um, but again, I tell you, as I told you, as I started this presentation, I had one good idea. And my, I have no, my ego is not very big. Um, matter of fact, when people come to try to sell me stuff, and they go, Jim, you're the CEO. I was like, yeah, that doesn't mean I can make the decision, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, I, I don't have that, that huge ego. So we really, really um, embrace uh, feedback from the field and the customers as well. So here are two of my customers, Manhattan Associates, Big, um, and, I, and I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I, I have quotes from smaller organizations, but here are a couple I just thought were appropriate for the audience. Um, the degree of collaboration is not the kind of thing that we really have been accustomed to with vendors. So I was really grateful to see that change in direction and that opportunity for collaboration with the References Online team. And References Online was really great about listening to what we needed and making it happen. And I guess maybe because I don't come, I'm not a product developer, and I said, here's the thing I want. I just knew I had the pain, and I brought other people in to build it for me. And I think that's a, you know, I guess from a culture standpoint, that's pretty important as well um, when you're rolling it out. Uh, and, that, and, that, and, and people feel empowered because I've taken that element of ego out of the equation and said, you know what, I don't know. I mean, what do you guys think? And that's a big uh, part of who we are. Um, lots of customer contact. I mean, I, I've heard since I've been here, my first question was, I wonder if these folks know Twitter. <laughs> and since I've been here, I've heard all kinds of social media talk. So I'm, I, do, I do not need to educate you on Twitter or Facebook or any of those new vehicles. But I will share with you a little bit later how we're implementing it on behalf of our customers because of their input, which I think is kind of very cool. Very cool. Um, Lots of face-to-face -face me. I mean, the, you saw from the slide, there's a lot of interaction. Um, I don't have to go through the communication styles, but it, it is clear and our customers do feel that they are part of the new product roadmap, part of, the pro part of, the, uh, uh, part of what we bring to market. We're not the only one, right? So here's a few examples. Procter & Grant, 
Procter and Gamble. I don't need to bore you, but I'm sure you can read uh, some of the stuff. But I will share with you one of our other customers, Xerox. And incorporating, uh, you were mentioning, uh, incorporating some social uh, media concepts. So here's it. So the guy that ran it was our customer. His name is Umang, and Umang Shah, and he is using some of these social media tools. So when I say to you, when you think of Xerox, what do you think of? Right. So he asked this question to the social community, and they came back with stodgy, old school. Old-time products, right? And you know, sturdy, dur durable, and that's probably some of the things that you and I just came up with as well um, on what we did for Xerox. But he went to the product development group and he goes, "What do you think of when we say Xerox products? Revolutionary, cutting edge, leading edge, all that stuff." And so he was able to really kind of see by leveraging some of these social media tools how it's impacting Xerox. So they. And you know, so they are. That's a great example of how social media is really impacting some of uh, real-world examples. Because I was the same. I was the same way when Twitter first came out and, for, corp, and Facebook. I was like, what am, "Who wants to know I'm coming? You know, who wants to know this? Who, I don't get it. I don't get it." But here are some pretty exciting ways that people are using it, and I was like, "Yeah, that makes sense." Um, Dell obviously is is huge on bringing uh, with their online community and. Uh, and uh, they have a big story on how, I'm sure I won't bore you with the details, but how they did not embrace social media at first. And it's a well-known case study, but uh, they learned their lesson in a, heart, in a big way. Um, and Whole Foods, obviously le leveraging uh, websites and uh, Twitter to listen to customers' feedback and answer questions. So, you know, just really getting a gauge of what's happening in the marketplace. Any other comments on some of these? Um, strong, solid client relationships enable us to test products. Uh, you guys do beta, alpha, beta testing, been part of it, right? So, you know, Joel, our marketing, de marketing department was interested in that we don't charge, you know, we don't have to give our beta programs away. Because what we do is we kind of, we, we kind of, you know, we know the vision. We kind of know where we're headed with some products based on the feedback. And then once we get a little closer to it, we really say, hey, come on in, Sybase. Hey, come on in, Manhattan Associates. And when, because we're built on, we're leveraged the SaaS model, we're able to not just do PowerPoint slides and, and wireframes. We're actually able to kind of build some workflow and invite the customers in and visit with them online using WebEx, using all this stuff, and garner and capture customer feedback immediately. So they go, I don't like how this is, and I don't like this, and what about this, and how about this? And they really start to buy, and as any sales guy knows, you get some engagement from your prospect, it's harder not to close that deal. When you get engagement from your customers on what they want in the new product, they're already halfway there. So when, I, when we're, we're actually rolling out a new product as we speak, um, it's not, we don't call it a beta. We call it maybe an early stage customer. Um, and you know, we just roll right into it. And they, they've already had that much impact, input and in working with the solution that it's a natural fit for them. Um, but again, this, this slide, I don't like to focus on negatives. But, uh, Right? It could be, you know, do you just say, oh, great, Jim. You just like tell all your customers, tell you what you want. You just load it up into the system, which isn't exactly how it works. And true, se development loves it when I sell, you know, it's like, it's just, a, just development. <laughs> right? They, that's not so funny to them. But, um, and, and, and it is interesting. When I do get them on the phone, they, the developers, say, that's interesting. Well, that's interesting. When they go, that's interesting, I know it's not high on their list or things that they think is very interesting. So the key is really setting up a communication process where you can bring in the information. You can bring it all in, and then you can prioritize what you think is going. Because as, as, as important as that you have the, um, the customer feedback, it's also, you also have to battle that with what your own vision for the product is. Because we have stayed true, only now are we actually starting to think about altering the names of some of our products and branding and messaging because it's evolved so much. But for seven years, it's been pretty, pretty, I've been able to sit on this chair and say, what do you do? 
I help you with close more deals by helping you leverage your references in ways you never thought of before. That message is still true seven years later. And that is a big key because of staying on message. But we continue to evolve and, and you'll see some of that. Um, market research absolutely comes from your customer feedback. Uh, customers don't mind testing since they're the ones who are suggesting it and amazing loyalty. And I can tell you again, as I shared earlier, I had the phone calls. You know, you, you, know, we, you know, some of our customers, you know, six figures license fees on a yearly basis for a SaaS product. That's pretty tremendous. And they were like, Jim, just want you to know that because of your team and your solution, you made the cut. We have cut in all these, oh, we are, I mean, no, right? And what was the big thing, right? Going into the new year, everything, every, all budgets are sliced at least 20%. They were looking for things to chop. And they came to us and said, you're, you're too much of an integral part into our workflow and our processes. And that wasn't because me coming up with some great idea that says it should be done this way. This is them telling me we need it this way. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, so let me just walk you through a little bit of, of, of how we got from a, you know, one idea. So, and this is, I mean, think about it. So put yourself in my position. You're sitting there and you say, hey, I got this great thing. And I was like, so it was like, yeah, let's not beat up our customers anymore. Why don't we do, why don't we hire that third party company, me, to conduct an interview? And we started doing it over the phone, right? So we do an audio interview and then we get all these interviews and they're sensitive topics, these references, right? You chose to go with salesforce.com. You could have went with Siebel. How come? What'd you like about it? You know what? They're telling me it's going to take three weeks to get you up and running, to get me up and running. How long did it take for you? Right? You're from Boston? I'm from Boston. Jeez, now give me the real scoop, right? I mean, these are the types of questions that you want to get. Are they appropriate for the corporate website, right? Which is traditional, the happy-go-lucky testimonials? No, these are pretty real, powerful things. And um, so we, we captured them. And how many people have patience to actually listen to a whole video or a whole audio interview, right? You're like, <laughs> fast forward. So what we do is we break each of those interviews down by individual topic, right? So, and we put a timestamp. This one's a minute, this one's 30 seconds, this one's two. Because in B2B sales cycles, we're selling to multiple decision makers. We have, and I, and I wanted to share, show you an example, but um, picture uh, the, an interview done by us where we break the interviews down by individual topics. There's a play all button. Seven years. Not, and our customers, SAP, Sun Microsystems, Centerstone Technologies, so on and so forth, not one of their prospects has ever hit the play all button. Right? So I was like, wow, that's cool. And then or they were like, well, we don't want all this information just on our corporate website. So they really helped us build out the technology that says, you know what, we want to be able to invite, we want to be able to pick the two or three references that I want to show this. Because they want to know somebody with their business problem, their size company, their decision maker, this, that, and the other thing. So they wanted to go in and pick. So the system decided to do that. And then the system decided, you know, and then we have all this tracking mechanism that says, hey, Julian went in, he looked at this interview, he clicked on this topic, here's his follow-up question. So from a sales rep perspective, you've got engagement and you've got a great way to do it. Then our customers said, you know what, Jim, we would like it. You know, these audio interviews are good, but can you, you get video? Sure, we've got video. Now, another real world example is, you know what, these, everybody's got Skype, right? The new laptops have got the uh, little camera there. So what we're doing now, based on customer feedback, is we now will send a flip camera along Instead of flying a video crew out, doing a video shoot, we will send the video camera with a one-page instructions, plug in a USB port, and then, and then Dan will be, Dan's team will be on the other end saying, could you move a little to the left or to the right? Hey, tell us a little bit about ba 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 Right? We cut the cost of our video interview service from $3,500 to $1,500. Plus, the reference client keeps the flip camera. Right? I didn't come up with that. I mean, the customer said, hey, what about this? We did interviews in... English. SAP's a customer. We now do interviews in over 20 different languages. We now, they came and they said, you know what, Jim, this is great, but could we set up an IVR system where, and do, the, do some interviews maybe in German or, or French, where the people can call in and leave their messages and leverage the same technology like American Airlines and United Airlines does? I was like, let's try it. All supporting this concept of the references. And then it took on a world of its own where I said, um, 
where our customers would say, hey, Jim, we asked our clients, hey, would you do an audio or video interview? And they said no. And that kind of shoot, shoots my whole way I started the business, right? But they go, Jim, we don't have anywhere to put this. You know, they did say, Julian did say, he will take phone calls from prospects, but don't call him every day, right? How about once a month? And don't call him the last week of the month. He'll talk to VCs, but only these. these well, where do we put all that stuff? So that started the reference view database and it evolved from there. So that's kind of where we're headed. And now where we were talking about social media is, um, I don't know if I'm on this right here. Let me come back uh, here. So now we, we, we're coming out real time with this new product and it's all about social media. Because if I asked you, you guys are coming to market, you're thinking about, all right, what marketing stuff do I need, right? Do I need video interviews? Do I need these references that this cat's telling me about right here? Do I need a case study, a press? What do I need? And how do I know it's good? I mean, Intel Corporation, who's a customer, they, did a sur they do a survey to all their salespeople. Hey, which tools, which marketing assets do you like the best? I mean, it's very subjective. Like, it's a survey. Our tool now can say, when, I leave, when you think about a presentation that you give, of an on-site visit, you're going to go home and you're going to say, hey, Elizabeth, it was great to meet you today. We covered a few things and you said you would like this press release or this case study. And you do an attachment, right? It's got three attachments. And then there you go. Our system now has that ability to create this really cool spotlight that has the video interview, the case study, the press release. And you invite them to go check it out and the system will now track did they look at the case study? Did they look at the press release? How long did they stay there? What feedback did they have? And that's the key, because now, when you send a press release or you send a case study, it'll go back and say, hey, Joe, notice you're checking out this case study. Did it have all the information you were looking for? You know what? No, it didn't. I was looking for the ROI analysis. I can't find it in here. So the next time your marketing department or you spend good money to build a marketing asset, you've got real feedback from your customers and prospects on what they want. And to me, that's not rocket science, but it's not done. And again, I didn't come up with that idea. I had one good idea, and that's my story. Thanks so much to Jim. Jim, I knew you would be a good speaker, but I did not know you would be a phenomenal speaker and so engaging. And I love hearing Jim's story because it's so relatable, isn't it? Some of the challenges that he had as well as, you know, some of the progress that he's made, it definitely makes us feel like we can do it too. So that's one of the things I really appreciated about what you shared. I'm going to go ahead and have the panel, starting with Julian, introduce themselves, tell a little bit about where you are right now which for you is going to be probably the most interesting. All right, I'm Julian Gallo, uh, technologist by background, uh, many long years in software, but uh, I knew from the beginning, I think going back into probably middle, even earlier school, that, uh, that I was an entrepreneur at heart. I think that can be made, but they're pretty much born. So I share mutual respect with Jim here for everybody else and for you, Jim, for having done it also the hard way. Um, so uh, an entrepreneurial career as well. A strong business inclination. I, I enjoy business. I find it interesting in its own right. And um, I enjoy to look at models and methods and practices and successes and failures and uh, learn from them and practice and execute them. Um, the things, some of the things I've been doing most recently uh, include uh, taking products to new markets to expand a customer base and the other way around to within the same customer base bring new products that were perhaps not as obvious to the customer until you um, explain them as, as Jim might do. 
right? Um, so I've had some fun with that recently. Um, I think I'll say more later. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ilan Shamir, and I live in Fort Collins, uh, president of Your True Nature. Uh, my background is with 7-Up, the Ancola, during the late 60s, early 70s. Remember, these are cola nuts, these are Ancola nuts. It was part of the marketing um, genius that I was able to learn from Orville Resch, Mr. Ancola. He said my course of being untraditional, unique, um, and uh, always looking to think outside the box. So I, I'm president of Your True Nature, as I mentioned. It's a company that uh, has a line called Advice from Nature. Advice from a tree, advice from a river, advice from an owl, a hummingbird, night sky, many different advices. We're uh, leading sellers in the national parks. We have books and journals, posters, t-shirts. Uh, we've actually been able to get our biggest success from licensing. And uh, we'll talk about later about the customers, what we learn from our customers. And we've been able to tap into the power of licensing somebody and then setting up the agreement so that all the innovations become our proprietary uh, okay. uh, enhancements and we're able to use them. So that one key factor alone has kind of launched our business to the next level. Um, we also have an online tree greetings, uh, electronic greeting card site. And I'm also a keynote speaker. And so my business model is basically diversity during these times. And it's uh, seemed to work very well. And we have a great time at it. I'm Mark Behrens. I'm president of Tri-Synergy Consulting. We work with businesses in their customer service. Cust we work with businesses in their customer service and customer contact areas. Um, a lot of our clients are trying to figure out how to better use technology and their, improve their processes to interact with their customers. And I started out in technology 20 some years ago, um, working in industry, moved into consulting, um, spent oh, almost 10 years implementing CRM systems for those of you that have been around customer sides or technology sides, customer relationship management, CRM, um, one of the big buzzwords of the 90s and then happy to um, see everybody declare that CRM was a failure and just like any other technology, what we had the opportunity to learn again and again and again is that there aren't any silver bullet technologies, right? <clears throat> it comes down to the technologies are often fine. It's the processes that you have behind it. And guess what? There aren't really all that many silver bullet processes either. It comes down to the people. And what's really interesting now is that um, businesses are really struggling with the idea that it doesn't even come down to our people as much as it comes down to our customers and our people's engagement with their customers. So this is a great topic. Um, the business or services that I would provide to my customers, helping them evaluate technology, look at their existing technology, decide how to better deploy it to support their contact channels. And again, as you start looking at um, how are we going to interact and engage with our customers, especially as you start to get out into social media, um, that becomes a whole different animal because now I'm reaching out into an environment where I don't have control. I don't have control of the conversation. I don't have control of the people. I don't have control of the technology. So um, this is really, really a paradigm changing time that we're in. Um, so it's fun to get to be a consultant and work with folks and try to be one step ahead of your customers and, and learn as you go. Um, and also one of the probably the most valuable lessons I learned early in my days as a consultant was in fact it was okay for me not to be a step ahead of my customers. And I'm sorry, can you repeat that last mark? Was that I actually learned that it was important for me and okay for me not to be a step ahead of my customers. Um, I will never forget that one day at the whiteboard when I was arguing with the client and realized that I was only arguing with him because he was right and I was wrong. Um, <clears throat> and there was somehow this ego in there that that wasn't okay because I was the consultant. And when I got past that, we had a great relationship, much better project. Um, and it was really that beginning of the relationship of, OK, I should bring something to the table, but so should my client. And I think that goes to the topic of discussion tonight also is that, you know what, so do your customers. And the sooner that you recognize that, your customers are very eager to bring that to the table. And um, my job is helping businesses figure out, OK, how do we make it easy for the customers to bring that to the table and be a part of the discussion? Great.
Well, one of the things, Jim, that you touched on, and I have to stand over here. <laughs> they all smell wonderful. I do have to say that. <laughs> They're getting feedback from my microphone. So, Jim, one of the things you touched on as you spoke, um, it, you are very fortunate, I think, to have been self-funded the whole time through what I will tell you is his amazing ability to paint the picture or sell the dream to his clients before it's reality. And Dan Montoya, his VP of operations, can sometimes want to choke him because he'll go in and he would sell it to you and you would think it's already ready to go and, and he'll, you could buy it today when in actuality it's in process. So one of the things I want Julian to speak to is what if you don't have the luxury that Jim had which is already paying customers who are willing to fund your R&D or your development um, of new product. What do you do in that case? What if these entrepreneurs out here have an idea but they don't have anyone buying it yet? What are their options? Sorry, let me ask, are you asking about funding options or neither internally nor externally funded? How about both? <laughs> and can you hold the microphone a little bit closer? Sure. Well, I don't think we need to go through the litany of, um, of the external funding options, uh, friends and family, angels, professional investors such as venture capitalists and so on. And uh, Jim, you had a lot of long experience with that and we could swap some stories as could many others, I'm sure. That's a long, fun road. That's a topic for many, many a night in its own right. Um, the internal funding, I, I, you know, th there is something that, well, let me paint a very brief picture here that um, there's some types of, of um, entrepreneurial activity that just require enormous amounts of money um, to even get started in any form, and, and then you can't be sure what the outcome's going to be. You kind of, you're taking enormous risk. So something like a biotechnology development, um, tens, even hundreds of millions of dollars, and then you could fail. Uh, that's just the reality of that extreme, if you like, of, of risk. Um, at the other end is uh, something, at the other extreme is something that you can invent and you can bring to market and you can generate some sort of revenue from, and external money or some other form of investment would accelerate that, it would create a better product, would take it to more markets faster, and uh, scale up your operations so that you can grow this thing on some sort of trajectory. So um, if, you, if you don't have either, I think you have a real problem. <laughs> <laughs> you might find something else to apply your time to, unfortunately, because there are many, many good ideas that unfortunately require some external funding but don't get it or alternatively run out before the internal funding comes along. But um, again, many, many folks here will be able to tell stories about internal funding and how to control costs and how to maximize um, the money you do have available. Um, how to get um, a rifle shot, how to get the best value out of the money you do have. So it would be nice to have a large staff and an enormous marketing budget, um, a big sales force, and a development team working on 3.0 of the product um, when you haven't yet quite got 1.0 uh, selling properly. So a lot of cost containment issues that entrepreneurs, by definition, are, are thinking ahead, they're thinking big, uh, they're ambitious, um, maybe a touch of ego in that as well. But the reality is that sometimes you have to go into lockdown mode and, and find uh, that core that will work with this budget, in that market, with those customers, this product, and go execute on that. Because in your travels you've talked with a lot of entrepreneurs, do you find that most people think they need outside funding when perhaps they really can do more internally? That, that's a great question, Joy. They, they, um, what they want to do with external funding is what I described. They want to scale really fast. They want to uh, make, make a market presence really fast. They want to build that sales force, as I described, and be anticipating and responding to the market and the customers, the next generation of the product. But um, it, they can go an awfully long way. They, it, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive to a lot of entrepreneurs to have to scale this back and face a reality that they're going to have to go on a much slower pace for some time, either till they generate sufficient internal money or raise that external money. Very often, what they're able to achieve with less is what attracts the external investor. Of course, patience is something entrepreneurs have in spades, usually. <laughs> <laughs> Life is that short, and of course, they have three, three and five more ideas, so they're really impatient to get this one going. So exactly. You'll feel the next. <laughs> Ilan, the next question is for you. Tell us more about your true nature. It sounds like this is an extremely collaborative environment, so I want you to spend a little bit more time Tell us a little bit more about that and how you're listening to customers. Okay, uh, your true nature is my own personal journey to really find out who am I, what am I about, 
and to combine it with my business experience, not only just on a personal basis, but how can I make a living? How can I make a living so I can send my daughter to college? How can I make a living so I don't have to struggle as an entrepreneur? So it's really the blending of two of my disciplines. I have a degree basically in business and in art. I've always been sort of schizophrenic that way. But I've tried to make it bring the both sides of me together. And I realized it's about my personal journey. But I can say now that I do live my true nature. It's actually pretty awesome. I have a great relationship with my 21-year-old daughter. She's last year of college. I'm able to set my own hours in my work. Uh, I'm able to write these different advice from nature's, for example, advice from a volcano. I went to Mount St. Helens. Basically, it's a vacation, it's a tax write-off. Uh, so I identify six advices, you know, advice from a campfire, advice from a volcano, advice from a sea otter. I take these great vacations, tax-free. So the line, um, let's see, how, how do I, and, and I think, and, and I live my true nature because I love to dance, I love to do the things, and I get to do those. I have a housekeeper, a gardener, various things. I don't make a lot of money, but I make enough money, and I, and I spend it wisely so that I'm balancing what my values are. So it's taken many years to, 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 to work out my lifestyle, but I don't risk it all by going into a lot of debt. Um, one of the things that um, I've been able to do is to listen to our customers. So for example, um, Willow is a store in Boulder. I took a bookmark and advice from a tree, for those of you who don't know, advice from a tree is stand tall, stand proud, sink your roots deep into the earth, reflect the light of your true nature, go out on a limb, drink plenty of water, be content with your natural beauty, enjoy the view. Very simple wisdom from nature. It struck a chord with many. Actually, Meredith Vieira of Today Show mentioned it, Oprah on her blog. It seems like it's this very simple wisdom. Um, so I made a bookmark. I took it into the, it was the buyer. And I said, and I'm thinking this bookmark, oh, 25 or 50 cents. You know, that's probably what it'll sell for. But I decided to listen to my customer. So I said to Melinda, how much would you sell this for in your store? She goes, 295. Wow, works for me. <laughs> how often do we undervalue our own, uh, what we have to share. So I think getting the customer feedback from that, she began to sell hundreds of these bookmarks. And then she, came, she called me up and said, have you ever thought about doing a little mini book? And I said, sure. <laughs> we'll have it, how many would you like to buy? And she said, sure, write me down for a couple dozen. So I always do, when people give me ideas, I say, well, how many would you like to buy? Uh, Shane Ring up at Rocky Mountain National Park. The national parks have a dark sky initiative. They want to promote the, the beauty of the dark skies so you can see the stars. So they come to me and they say, we, 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 um, we'd like you to do advice from a night sky poster. I said, well, you know, I would be happy to do that. Uh, we weren't planning on doing it, but I could move it up the queue a couple of years if I can get you to send me a purchase order to place your order, and then we can get it moving. He says, well, how many would you want? And um, he said, well, I can do 200 posters. And you know, they're, that's at wholesale is six, that's $1,200 order, which is nice, because the print run costs $2,500. And so I can sell 200, and I've got 1,800 left over to sell at a profit. Do you see how the math works in this? But I did say to him, how about 300? <laughs> he goes, sure. Okay, so he's now a partner, and uh, we've actually got into a lot of the other national parks. So you're saying that the customers have basically been telling you what they want. Right. And you've been listening, and therefore you're producing new product as a result. Yeah, a customer, retail customer said, why don't you put 25 of the advice together in a little book? And it took us about eight months to do it. We, we actually put it into advice from nature and more advice from nature. And those have been really excellent books. So we're, uh, with my customer service folks, we have a form that says, if the customer tells you an idea, write it down, bring it to, we have once a week called Group Wisdom. 
So we have a mechanism for capturing that. We discuss about them in group wisdom. On our web store, we also have a place. Tell us about how you like our product. And, and so they fill it out, and they're happy to tell us a little bit about their experience. So in, in all forms, on our website, uh, we capture that information. And it actually uh, uh, um, is, gives us our most powerful ideas. Uh, I, I don't know whether you'll be telling now but or later, but I, I want to talk about the licensing or licensees. I'm gonna, yeah, hold I, I on did that. want to ask you about that. I'm going to have you hold on just a second. Sure. I wanted to ask Mark a quick question about the service side of things versus more of the product side of the world. How do you listen to your customers on the service side? You and I share a commonality in terms of service. And what I did, you know, a few years ago when I started the business doesn't look like it does now. I've evolved with what customers have asked me to be able to provide for them. How has, for you in the service business, how have you evolved your services as a result of what your customers have asked of you? Well, or have you? I'm sorry, that was a loaded question. <clears throat> have you? Well, it's interesting because in the space that I work in, um, the evolution hasn't moved as fast as it has in, in a number of other areas. Um, so I don't know that I can point to a, a lot of dramatic change over what I do now versus um, what I started doing when I started this company eight years ago. Um, and actually I was at a, a contact center conference back in April and one of the analysts that presented talked about research that they had done that said, you know, you could take a typical customer service area or a call center manager today and drop them or from 1990 and drop them into a call center today and they would feel right at home. They would say, you know, where's the report to measure this? And somebody would produce it because for the most part, our customer service attitudes and measures and approaches haven't changed all that much in the last 20 some years. So um, back to what's going on now, this is really a very interesting time because um, businesses have spent more and more time focusing on getting really good at doing the wrong things. So um, a lot of the, the customer service areas um, have really focused on how can we be very efficient. You know, handle time is the term that gets used to describe the amount of time we spend talking to a customer. And the good news is that more and more organizations move away from handle time, but it's still out there. And a lot of my clients, a lot of businesses focus on how do I turn that time down? Mm -hmm. So um, unlike the example that Alon talked about of, gee, we're going to get together once a week and collect all this wisdom that our customers gave us, most organizations in this country spend their time figuring out how can we avoid that, okay? And in fact, we'd like to talk less to our customers and wherever possible, we'll get good at, at figuring out how to automate that. So, where what I have seen um, coming from more of my customers and that's changing my focus now is less on that. So eight years ago, nine years ago, a lot of what I did was around that, how do we do self-service? Let's have an IVR, let's do the web. Now people are starting to realize, you know, that the best contact is in fact no contact at all. So rather than let's figure out how do we, A, take this conversation and make it shorter, or even better yet, make it self-service, the real question is, why are we having this conversation, okay? So, why is it that this customer is trying to contact me? And there are some contacts that are good, so if I'm in a sales business, I want that sales contact, but if this is a service or a support contact, it's probably occurring because something broke. So, rather than optimizing how can I reduce, you know, optimizing the amount of time around that contact, let's step back and look at the customer experience. Um, and that's really, we, we keep relearning those same lessons. I spend a lot of time talking with peers and vendors out on Twitter, and periodically somebody will say, well, that's not CRM, there's no system, and then periodically somebody will remind them, yeah, but there are customers. And we're talking about customer relationship management, not technology management. Um, and the, the circle that we're now able to come around with the power of the technology today is to actually go back to that kind of social community network of, well, what would you like from me? What are you thinking about today? How can I help you? How can I interact with you as 
a peer, not as a um, somebody in a company position of power. So um, in terms of what that's driving for me, you know, learning how to A, deal with my customers differently, and um, you know, in a services business, you can't sell to people. They buy from you when they need something. It's something you figure out too. Um, so you can't go out to people and say, hey, I'm gonna sell you some consulting. What you can do is engage them in conversations and find out what their issues are and then have some good ideas. So it's easier today to do that. Um, and one of the other changes is the pace of change and the availability is having to realize that um, you need to be much more collaborative and open, okay? More what? More collaborative and open. So, um, and again, the social networks really make that very clear that in the exchanges that I have with people, um, there are vendors who are competitors and other consultants who would be my competitors if we're at the same table going after your business, but you see a radical change in terms of let's collaborate on this. That whole discussion of, well, if we're not trying to optimize the interaction, but instead figure out should the interaction be there and have the right ones, now there's a discussion going on in one of the groups on Twitter around what's the new customer service dashboard look like? Mm -hmm. The old one was handle time, after call wrap, error rates. The new one is much more around customer loyalty, customer satisfaction, value. We don't have any tools to measure that. And technology doesn't lend itself well to that. And what you're seeing now, instead of the consultants sitting there saying, I've got this idea, you've got people out there saying, let's work on this together. Um, and it's not just happening in a room like this, but it's happening in a virtual room that goes around the globe. So. That's wonderful. Well, one of the things I've admired about Jim, and he did share tonight, was he's he's been unwavering from the focus on customer references. And just you, you spoke just briefly about it tonight. One of the things that you finally branched out into, simply because your customers have been begging for it, is this whole idea of the spotlight, where you can send out other marketing assets with the audio and video references to create more of a complete reference picture. At the same time, with the small business angle, you've introduced testimonials on demand, which is basically for those people out there who said, I want to showcase testimonials of my customers, but I don't need an, enter excuse me, an enterprise solution. So you know, I think one of the things I've admired about you is you've always stayed true to that one idea of you know, sales cycles can be improved when you, you know, have that word of mouth component from satisfied customers and from true customer feedback. So I guess the question that I have, similar to what Mark was just talking about, you dipped into app exchange, so salesforce.com. Was that as a result of a request from a customer or did you just see that as a, per a perfect plug-in with your solution to go into a CRM solution? You might need a microphone. On. Um, yeah, very good question because it was absolutely because of customers. And they said, are you part of the app exchange? And I said, do I need to be? And they said, if you want my business, yes, you do need to be on the app exchange. And then in talking to salesforce.com, they painted the picture of all of the marketing benefits and hey, everybody else is gonna be able to find you and it only costs this much money. Um, and I would have said no, had my customers not said it's a requirement to do business with us that you are part of App Exchange, which the App Exchange is a pretty outstanding program that Salesforce.com gives to their, you know, allows their customers to benefit from because you have to go through this extensive audit process to be part of this App Exchange. So um, the customer, the end customer, has the confidence knowing that you've been vetted, if you will. Um, but if it was purely a marketing play where I said, hey, let's become part of this app exchange and look at all these other customers we could potentially get access to and try to push or sell our wares to, I would not have done it initially. Um, but because my customers said, hey, you need to be part of it, it was the reason we joined it. And then yes, we did enjoy some marketing benefits, not to the extent Salesforce.com said we would, <laughs> However, it was, and to this day, still is a compelling reason 
people do business with us. So how have you had the discipline to stay true to that focus? Because I know from personal experience, when that dollar is offered for something slightly off of center, how do you say no? When, again, you, when you need that dollar. <laughs> again, I have one good idea. And I built a team around me that uh, helps me say no. And it helps me stay focused. And um, it is very much, it, 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 we do, I do the litmus test that says, can I go sell this? And can I do this? And you're right, you can go in so many different directions. Julia just said, like, I probably have a few other good ideas, but by remaining true to this, it's allowed people to rally around it and grow accordingly. Again, all based on the customer. Great. I'm going to take a few um, questions from the audience. Who's got questions? What do you think has really changed, though, in the way that we treat customers? How much, I mean, you've alluded to it a little bit, all of you, but what, what's really changed? Because for the most part, if I call a Bank of Americard or somebody else or a software company, that customer service model really hasn't changed. So where is the change taking place and how is it taking place? So um, it's not changing in the really big companies um, as quickly. Uh, it really is a, a um, what, what's changing there, I don't know, anybody see the um, YouTube video on United Breaks Guitars? Love that. Right, okay, so that's been out for how long now? Only a couple weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and what was really interesting, we happened to notice that sometime before, and I think it was just fortuitous on their part, Southwest had put out an ad saying, we'll stick our neck out for you, which was a image of a guitar with a long neck. <laughs> so <laughs> they should revive that ad, <laughs> um, especially together with the United YouTube. So what has changed is that um, the customers actually now have got that ability to go someplace else to be heard when, when the corporation doesn't want to hear them. And there is a way to make themselves heard. Now, you're seeing more and more organizations start to look at, uh, I go to a lot of, of events and they're, the focus this whole past year has been on customer experience. So like never before in the last 20 years that I've been doing this, people are looking at, let's have a conscious design of what our customers experience when they use our product or service. And I think for an entrepreneur, it's both an opportunity and probably a real challenge because you're focused on all these things you have to get done and thinking about what's my customer going to do when they do this or what if something doesn't work may not be top of mind, but it's really important to do it. Much easier to bake that in early into your processes and your culture than when you get big because by the time you get big and you've sort of separated out this idea of Here's the call center, and oh, that's a cost, so let's outsource it. We'll make it as cheap as possible. Uh, that's not consistent with the brand that says we care. I mean, you know that when you see those Bank of America ads, right? They can have those ads run all day long, and nobody's going to believe it, because when you call the call center, the experience doesn't match, doesn't match the marketing. And um, what people are realizing more and more is that customers rely on people like me, right? So more than experts, more than professionals, more than somebody in the business, they would much more likely take advice from someone they perceive to be like themselves. And that's what's gonna drive this change, is that it's possible now to find people like you, find huge communities of people like you, and share those ideas. I heard a uh, spot on NPR this week uh, they were talking about summer movies, and apparently even the worst dog of a summer movie used to have a lifetime of a couple weeks. Now it's got 12 hours. People are in the theater and they're on their phones sending out tweets, they're on Facebook, they're on whatever, talking about this movie's great or I hate it. So literally the next day, that movie is done if it's not good or it's got legs. And that's the change that will eventually you know, cause the, the big companies to have to make shifts. Mark, I've got a quick question for you, and, and a real quick answer from you is what I'm looking for, and that is, how much more does it really cost to care? 
you know, you were just talking about Bank of America. How much more does it really cost to be genuine and truly care? Um, I don't know that you can measure it. I mean, on the, for a big company like that, it's huge because it's not part of the culture. It's not part of the process. It's not part of the organization. So to make that change, you are turning the Titanic. Okay, great. Um, much simpler to start from a company that has that culture where the CEO is going to go down and answer calls, listen to customers, talk to customers, and model that behavior to begin with than to try sense. to add that on. Okay. And Jim, that's one thing I think you do really well if I can brag about you one more time, and that's you, you've never lost touch with those customers. From the moment they sign their contract, years later, you know, they still have you on speed dial and they still have a relationship with you, and I think that's what helps engender that trust. kind of on what Mark said, which is, you know, why are people needing to listen? Because the consequences are huge. I can share with you today that when somebody just tweeted us, they want to know what it's like to do business with references online. That's consequence. That's consequence of not listening to your customers come out in a timely manner when you say, when you give lip service, hey, this is nothing new, right? We've always, companies since, I mean, years since I've been in business, we always say, hey, the customer wants this, the customer wants that. And the commitment to the organization, oh yeah, yeah, that's great, put that on the list, put that on the list, right? Product development could have deaf ears. The consequences now are huge. That's, and, and to me, it's all about revenue generation. That consequent now impacts revenue. And it never really did before, because you could always just say, oh, yeah, 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 we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Now, if you don't take care of your customers, listen to them, and execute on what they're asking for in a way and communicate to them, the consequences are big. And we, I saw it literally today. The positive is the tweets went back to them that said, terrific organization, yada, yada. However, that is true consequence to not acting on what your customers are saying. Yeah, Jim, I get, I get the impression that you have a very unique, have created a very unique niche. And so my question is twofold. Do you really have any uh, virtually identical or similar competition? And the thing I got in one word of what you do is facilitator. And if there's a better word, I'd like to know what it was. <laughs> and uh, I may not even have it right. Oh, um. To all the fellow entrepreneurs out there, the one lesson, the one hard lesson I learned when I started in July 2002, I did not have a guy, I did not have one of the um, folks sign a non-disclosure, non-compete. And all of my vision and dreams and stuff, um, I created my own competitor. So I do have one, I do have somebody out there looking, trying to look a lot like me. Um, and then there are variations. People will say, hey, we'll teach, you know, we'll, we'll have, con there'll be consultants out there that will consult on reference management, best practices, strategy. Some people that might build a component of technology. We just, I just met a gentleman here earlier that had a, 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 some type of collaborative tool. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you can't, you know, they can steal an idea, but they can't steal your passion and your vision. And that's why I'm, I'm still proud of what we're doing. And regarding facilitating, do you think that what references online? You know what, what, I, again, so one of my customers came up with substantiate, right? Because everything you're out there doing is trying to substantiate why you are the vendor that they should be doing business with. Whether it be a case study, a press release, a video testimonial, audio inter reference interview, you're substantiating your position and your message to your prospects. But I do have to say I like the word facilitate, so let's write that I down. <laughs> I do have a question for you, Julian, and that is, one can, of the things, can, Jim. Can I can I can okay. I answer the previous question? <laughs> I have the microphone, so you know. Go right ahead. I asked. <laughs> I was just to make a comment about competition, um, and that is that uh, for a period I, I reviewed a lot of business plans, and one of the things we looked for was competition. And when folks said there isn't any, um, first it was a little implausible, but secondly, there was immediately a cause for concern. That means nobody else thought this was worth doing. Um, and of course, many new products come on the market quite frequently and they do um, get traction and they are successful. So that's not a golden rule to say no competition, don't do that. But it just, just, to, just to counter the competition discussion, and in fact, uh, with some folks I was working with recently, a, a product that is established in the market and gaining ground and so on, but 
they spend a lot of time trying to re-message who they are and what they do and try and make it unique. And my contribution to that discussion was, no, we should rather fit into an existing concept that our customer base understands. We used the, the phrase CRM here earlier, for, for example, today. That wasn't our product. But if you go to folks and say, we are a CRM package, everybody knows immediately what that is. You describe your differentiators and you go from there. Um, of course, the downside is there's competition. The upside is that you, you participate in a market that's established. To try and create a market as a new company or a small company, hard, right, Jim? Absolutely. To, 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 to be that definer of a market is very hard. Okay, I do thanks. have a follow-up for you in that. Thanks, Joy. Jim talked about, and I, because I know Jim, he's the idea guy. How, as a, for an entrepreneur, how do you find that other half? Now, whether someone in here is specializes in implementation and they're searching around for the right idea to make happen, or maybe they're sitting here with an idea looking around for help with implementation, what recommendations would you have to pair that those two halves up? You know, this is a pressing piece of cynicism, I'm going to just say the once and then move on, which is um, in my experience of listening to entrepreneurs tell their story post-fact about what went wrong, I would say the single largest factor that they describe is partners. The other people they pulled in, it all went bad because of the people, especially those closest to them. So setting that piece of pessimism aside, um, let's look at some fantastic success stories. Uh, Gates, Allen, and uh, Balmer, right? What a fantastic story. Uh, Michael Dell and is his name Kevin, his partner. They were, I think, were they in college together? Um, uh, uh, Larry Ellison. Simon and Garfunkel. Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> yes, thanks, Joy. <laughs> I stumbled for a moment. I was looking for that, that partnership precisely. That's right. <laughs> Beavis and <laughs> Yes. And. Um, the one I was thinking of, uh, until you corrected me, was uh, Larry Ellison and um, a couple of his partners, Ray Lane, I believe was his name, who's uh, moved on subsequently. So those are long, long, long enduring partnerships that had a, a very fine balance between what each of them did. Paul Allen, for example, left Microsoft, not doing so badly along the way, but he, he did leave. Um, whereas uh, Steve Ballmer actually took, this is an unusual story of succession, actually took over from Bill Gates. Um, and uh, there was a, a time in uh, Dell where, don't recall his name right now, but I think Kevin took over as CEO and within a couple of years Michael Dell was right back to try to go fix things. So what had been an excellent partnership for a very long time did not work when they, when they switched roles. Um, so those are some highlight stories to say that when you find the right partner, you're probably going to the moon. To do this entirely on your own, they're relatively few stories. Who was the entrepreneur, the egotist? And they certainly do have a very large ego, there's no question. But some of the biggest success stories include a very significant partner, even if he's not as well known and is not quite the front man as, as the, what's, who's recognized or seen as the founder. What other questions? We probably have time for one more. Hi. Um, I have a question on product development. Um, when, you are, when you are choosing the products that you are trying to develop, okay, you look at the market like competitively, you look at the competitive market and you're looking, okay, um, how am I going to go up against some of these other bigger guys. Um, I'm in the part where I'm developing products, trying to develop the right products. And do you have a guideline or something that that really helped you guys how to um, develop all of your products? Is there some kind of a guideline or something that would be nice for us to um, you know hear about? Guideline meaning resources, consulting, books. Not even just about that. I have a lot of resources. Okay, what I'm talking about is when you actually decide on that product, okay, what are some of the major factors that you look at to deciding that that is going to be the product you're going to put out? That's a great question, and Jim, we've talked about this with regard to, you, to um, you don't need to answer, but we've talked about not creating in a vacuum, right, because you'll have that problem that Julian just mentioned. If no one else is creating it, are you sure you're actually solving a problem? Ilian, go ahead. Okay. So, 
in designing books, it's a great product. And the profitability and the margins and the whole system that it is in is a tough market to make money in. So if I'm choosing a product, if I know that it's a book and I can have lower my profit expectations, of course you can get a big, huge big seller. But we realized a very interesting fact is a bookmark. I thought, shoot, it's only 250 295 we sell hundreds of thousands of bookmarks and the profitability is five times five to seven times greater than a book so one of my criteria is i need to have a lot of profit i need to have enough profit in it before i will put that into our line posters have a great profitability so um, the other one is, will it expand our market? In other words, we can do advice from uh, whatever. But if we did advice from a, let me see if I can come up with the example. Actually, we're doing wetland. It's a habitat. So suddenly it, it creates a whole new market. It's not just another owl. Uh, bluebird or, or something that's just going to kind of give people more choices within the market. It's going to expand the market. Um, other considerations, do I personally feel committed to it? Is it part of my passion? Am I, am I willing to stand behind it and say this is, this is who I am and this is a message I want to put out? We've had some great ideas that uh, could be profitable, that they could expand our market but they just didn't fit with me personally. Let's see the other criteria on product design. Um, Do your customers have to ask you for it first? You know you talked about how people would call into your customer service center. Does, do your ideas, do you t survey any of your customers via phone? Or do you use that mechanism at all? Mm, I actually go to trade shows. So trade shows is a great way just to talk with our customers and just say, hey, you know, we're coming up with a new series for next year. Can you give me any, any feedback? Um, we can tell from the reorders what's not selling. So we get rid of uh, advice from a penguin. You know, I, I realized I had a small detail. I mean, they're, they're, I have enough of them. Advice from a penguin, I thought, that's great. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be great for Alaska and all these places. And I forgot that their southern hemisphere, and I don't know how many customers we have in the southern hemisphere. So I gotta, <laughs> so you get these, you get these in the warehouse where you say, hey, these aren't moving. So I mean, there's, there's these funny thing. We did advice from a deer, but we got the wrong ears on the deer. So the parks say, I mean, so it's, it's, a, it's a constant humorous um, thing. So you gotta get research, not when you develop your, not only when you get, wanna get the idea, but then take a prototype out and get as much research as you can. Um, but that seems to kind of, there are probably other things that we do. Sure, well, we're gonna wrap up because I wanna leave plenty of time for networking, but I would like to give a huge, you know, thanks to this panel for being so phenomenal for this talk tonight.